the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. That's how the gospel of Mark starts. So here's the funny thing about the word gospel. A lot of us use it to refer to the stories about Jesus in the New Testament, which is fine. And sometimes I hear it used as a litmus test for good preaching. Folks will ask, does the pastor preach the gospel? Which is also fine. And sometimes people use the word gospel in place of the word truth. As in, everything Oprah says is gospel to me. But at the time the New Testament was written, the word gospel meant something quite different. See, 2,000 years ago, the word gospel was only used as a term for something like a military news flash. It was used when a messenger proclaimed that a victory had been won by the empire or the king. It was a pronouncement of good news. Something had happened that was good for the people. This sort of announcement was one that elicited a response, like when the owner of a crowded bar yells, drinks are on the house, everyone would naturally raise their mugs and say, yeah. The gospel according to Mark, the first gospel account to be written down, begins with these words. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Son of God. We don't really notice it anymore, but that is one loaded sentence. Not only did the term gospel have military connotation, so did the term Son of God. This was a phrase used for emperors who were worshipped as gods. So basically, the first hearers of Mark's stories about Jesus may have heard that first sentence as this, the beginning of the pronouncement of the military victory of Jesus Christ, the victorious holy emperor. And given a statement like that, they might have expected nothing short of liberating regime change. Instead, what they got was John the Baptist. With his camel's hair and rope ensemble, he probably looked like he should have been on the corner of 6th and Broadway holding a cardboard sign that says, we'll preach for locust and wild honey. Obviously, this is a weird way to announce good news. It certainly isn't the triumphant victory that Mark's audience expected. But maybe the crazy desert preacher is actually the perfect way to introduce the whole Jesus thing. Maybe cognitive dissonance is the only way to set us up for hearing about what God is doing. Because when it comes down to it, nothing else in the Gospels meets our expectations either. As odd as they are, the first few verses of the first Gospel tell me a lot about what all the Gospels have in store. Personally, I kind of expect something called good news to mean that I won the lottery, or I get free Starbucks for a year, or at least that I get to sit in the good seats. But instead, I get Jesus. I get a guy who was born under questionable circumstances, grew up in an unimpressive town, ate with all the wrong people, touched lepers, and said really disturbing things like, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first, and love your enemies. And as if that weren't enough, the guy goes and gets himself killed in a totally preventable way. And just like the original hearers of the gospel, I think, are you kidding me? That's like the worst good news I've ever heard. But in a way, that's the point. Because the fact is, anything I would come up with as good news would be hopelessly selfish. That's exactly why I need the gospel of Jesus Christ and not the gospel of Nadia. I need a story and an identity and a symbol system and some good news that comes from a source that is not myself. If Mark's gospel had been titled the beginning of the good short story of Jesus Christ, Son of God, then it wouldn't really be news. What makes it news is that it's something new that is external to us that we have to be told. I was talking to a non-religious friend who said, I just don't really need anything outside of myself to bring me hope and meaning. And I was like, oh my gosh, I totally need something outside of myself to bring me hope and meaning. I mean, if this is all there is, I just can't think of anything more depressing. I need hope 
and meaning that comes from something other than consumerism or human categories or status and certainly something other than gazing at my own navel. Were I deciding what news would be good, I guarantee it would never involve forgiving some schmuck 70 times 7 or selling my things and giving them to the poor and it, it certainly would have very little to do with dying to myself. But the fact that we pour ourselves into things and people and ideologies that never bring us life. The fact that we give our hearts to things that don't love us back. The fact that we can't fathom how selflessness and mercy and sacrifice can be good news is exactly why we need Jesus. This is why we need the God revealed in the Gospels. A God who comes to us not with winning lotto tickets in hand or military victories, but comes to us in the simple, common things that we can recognize. Things like human bodies, and bread, and wine, and conversation around tables. That's what makes it good, and that's what makes it news. And if we go back and look at those first few verses of Mark, we see that what we read in the Gospels truly is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God. It's not the whole story. It's not even most of the story because it doesn't stop there. Instead, the Gospels of Mark and Matthew and Luke and John tell us about Jesus. They tell us who he was and what he was here to do. And that good news has done its work in people for centuries. This story has freed people throughout the history of Christian faith from the original telling by those who witnessed it firsthand to the telling of it right now in this place where you've gathered. But Mark was right. Hearing is only the beginning of the good news. His declaration of the good news was meant to elicit a response. Those who have heard the story become part of the story. We are agents of the continuation of the good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God. This good news keeps being told and taking root in bars and small towns and African villages and underground meetings in communist China and even on TV with smiley preachers. We respond to this news by lifting pint glasses in the air and saying, yeah, when the bartender says drinks on the house. But rather than drinks on the house, it's forgiveness of sins, and it's God with us, and it's water, and wine, and bodies, and bread, and babies, and crosses. And every time we experience these supposedly ordinary things, we are again part of the continuation of the good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God. So, is that good news to you?